Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Samelvari Interviews. This time I will talk to Richard Turner, who is an expert card magician. And he has some... Let's call it peculiar or... Now I want to say extraordinary abilities. If you want to know more about the Delt movie that he talks about, please check out the description box and I will post a link to the documentary. But now, please enjoy. Hello, Richard Turner, and welcome. Hello, Samuel. <laughs> I will ask you three quick questions that you haven't received yet, so these are a little bit unprepared ones, but they are quite easy to answer, I hope. Okay. Rock or classical music? I like both. All right. Or in, in like some rock. kind of mixture? I or... like rock. Yeah. I'm sorry, rock. Classical music, country western, and uh, and gospel music. All right. Next question: the city or the forest? Forest. The forest. forest. All right. I thought you were a city man. <laughs> no, my life. My wife and I we hiked in the forest uh, two years ago. We climbed to the top of a mountain called uh, the Mountain. It was about almost seven miles high. And I, she would roll up uh, my shirt and hold it in her right hand, and I'd hold the other end in my hand, and I'd follow behind her. And uh, sometimes we were on the edge of a cliff that was a sheer cliff, you know, 30, 40 feet straight down, going over rivers. And the last part of the climb was um, a mile, and it was like a 45-degree angle. Very, very tough climb. That sounds great. All right, the last question before we begin Tea or coffee? Tea or coffee? Uh, I don't drink either. Oh. Ice water. Only <laughs> ice water. That's the only thing you drink? Only ice water. Huh. Interesting. All right. Richard, please tell the Swedish listeners about yourself. Who is Richard Turner? <laughs> Who is Richard Turner? Richard Turner is a person who loves life, is thankful for his life. Richard Turner is a person who's blessed with a beautiful wife named Kim, who is the love of my life. She's the prettiest, sexiest, smartest lady I know. <laughs> I have a wonderful son named Asa Spades, spelled A-S-A, -A, Spades, S-P-A-D-E. Asa means physician or healer. Like in the Old Testament from King David's grandson, his great-grandson was King Asa, and it means physician or healer. My son wants to be a physician or a doctor, hmm. and um, I'm a person who likes people. I have a passion for my, what I do, whatever I'm doing at the time, and of course my greatest passion has been cards, which I've been working at since I was about seven years old, after watching a TV show called Maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-C-K, and the main character, uh, Brett Maverick, uh, would, through his wiles, get himself out of different situations with the cards, and I always thought he was so cool, and I wanted to be a card mechanic, even though I didn't even know the term at that age, mm -hmm. but I knew I didn't want to lose at cards, my family played a lot of cards, and so I started working with cards, and then I started getting a reputation with my sister. She would tell my her friends, my brother's so good he never loses, and that inspired me to create more and more ways to make sure that I didn't lose. And uh, so it perpetuated itself from that point. And even as I'm speaking with you at this moment, since I'm holding the phone in one hand, I am doing a one-hand uh, shuffle strip out. A move I created back oh, 30, 35 years ago, no. or, or so. And uh, uh, and then my other love is uh, working out and uh, karate. I have a sixth degree black belt, and I started training uh, 41 years ago this March. Oh, that's quite much. <laughs> Many things you're doing at the same time. That's great. I love that. 
And right now you're doing a show called Khand with uh, Bob Arno, who is Swedish. Can you please tell us a little bit about that show? Okay, Bob Arno, oh, the, the whole show is called Khand, C-O-N-N-E-D, and it features four of the top Khand artists in the world. Uh, Bob Arno from Sweden, who is absolutely amazing. He, it's a, it's a funny show even though it's a mysterious show at the same time, because we're featuring all the ways you can be conned and, and all the different aspects. And, of course, Bob Arno, uh, who is not a comedian, but I don't think there's a comedian out there that will have the audience laughing harder than Bob will. Uh, the other person is Todd Robbins, who the New York Times calls the king of con. He uh, wrote a book called How to Get Something for Nothing and has been featured on a number of television shows like Jay Leno and so forth. And, mm. and, uh, and then the other is Banachek, B-A-M-A-C-H-E-K, which is a, he's a mental manipulator mentalist. And, uh, he, of course, he has a reputation that everybody should be familiar with. And yes. he uh, amazes the audience with uh, his uh, readings and his uh, bending, uh, having things bent in the hands of the uh, person on stage. And the thing about the show is we bring people up on stage, and at times the entire audience is conned. And, of course, my part, I'm the card mechanic. Uh, we have uh, a number of cameras. We have a camera overhead and uh, a couple other cameras, one that walks around and one that shoots straight on. So the audience will get the best view of what, what my cards are doing at that moment. Hmm. And I demonstrate you know, all many different ways you can be uh, cheated at the card table. And then I also tell a few stories uh, about gambling and gamblers and hustlers and hustling. It sounds like an excellent show. I really love the concept. Uh, to Con artists is one of my favorite subjects. Not to actually do it, but to read about them and how they do it and that kind of stuff. Yes, and, and we've had instant standing ovations at almost every show we've done. Audience just absolutely goes nuts. We also do a part of profiling and, uh, oh. and uh, how you can be uh, uh, what hacked. We have a hacker that's part of our team that will we'll take somebody from off stay on stage, we get their phone number, and then from there we show all the information. We use Google where it will z- zoom into where their house is, say, do you recognize this? Yes, that's my house. Huh. And uh, and then we just show how far you can be hacked and how much information can be uh, can be gained. And so that's another one of the parts of pieces in the in the show. I would love to see that show. <laughs> yeah. How long uh, are you going? The plan is to either go to Las Vegas or Broadway and then uh, tour it nationally or internationally. So uh, depending on the markets, you know, of course, you know the economy mar- and the markets. When I say markets, I mean the economy. Um, uh, will depend on when and where it gets stood up. We just stood it up, but now it's a matter of uh, where they're going to place it first. All right, uh, let's come back to you, Richard. As you said, you are a card mechanic and you have a sixth degree of uh, black belt in karate. The Wikipedia said fifth class, but you have advanced one since that one was written, I see. <laughs> how many hours per day do you practice with a deck of cards and how often do you work out or practice karate? Okay, we'll start with the cards. I started working with cards as a kid, and it was, a, it was a, just a, uh, a pastime uh, and a fascination. So that was just on and off you know, as I was growing up. And there were times in the first day of high school, first day of ninth grade, I, was, I got in trouble for playing cards, cheating at cards, and I was, uh, my cards were taken away and I was sent to the back of the classroom. That was the first day of ninth grade. <laughs> and uh, so I played cards all through high school. And then uh, when I turned 19, I was in a, th- when I turned 18, I was in a theater company. And I started uh, uh, just, as we would travel, I would always have cards working in my hand because I like to play poker. Mm-hmm. And I like to win at poker, and I was just fascinated with that John Scarney seeing old movies uh, like The Sting from the late seventies, where he was uh, where, uh, he was in the movie dealing seconds, and so I'm on a talk show and talking about a push off second. So I started working on these moves, and uh, then I got a uh, 
audio version of Expert at the Card Table by Erdnays. It was read many years ago by an old lady that sounded like she was going to keel over at the next breath, and it had no pictures, but <laughs> it did have descriptions. Uh -huh. So I started working from there, and um, and uh, then I met Di Vernon when I was when I turned 21, and uh, he uh, he took a liking to me, and so uh, he would uh, because I was really obsessive with my practice. I practiced at that time an average of 14 hours a day, but there would be some days I'd only practice 10 hours. That's when I had a, a karate class or I was in the gym. And then there are other days where I might start, I might get up at six in the morning and I might not get to bed till 3.30. So that would be like a 20 hour or so day practice where I was practicing uh, as much as 20 hours a day. But my average practice day was 14 hours a day. And I sustained that for 22 years, seven days a week, and he's four, an average of 14 hours a day. Then when my son was born, when I was 21, uh, because I would help feed him and he would slobber all over my cards, I was reduced down to between eight and 10 hours a day from like 41 to say, oh, 50. And then when I turned 50, I uh, decided that I slowed down a little bit more and so from then I practiced about between, oh, well, over the past eight years, probably between two and 12 hours a day uh, would be my practice time. But altogether, I've logged around 135,000 hours of practicing with the cards. <laughs> and to give you one example, of the second deal alone, my push-off sweep second, I have done in front of a live audience over five million times, and I have done that move in practice. I stopped counting in the 1990s at 43 million, and I estimated somewhere between 50 and 60 million times I have done um, what Vernon calls the Turner sweep second, push off sweep second. And then karate and working out, I started training 41 years ago this March. I have not stopped working out in that 41 years. I work out between three and seven days a week, average of five days a week, average of, well, for many years, I would work out two to four hours a day. Over Right now, I work out about an hour and a half to two and a half hours a day. That's immense. All these numbers are so huge. I'm I'm turning 30 quite soon and uh, I can, can't even imagine how much work you have put into these deck of cards. It's not, see, here's the thing. To me, it's not work. Uh, <laughs> at one time, about oh, eight or ten years ago, I was distracting people at church with my shuffling and so... But they said, can you not, you know, the people around you are watching you and not the minister. And so I said, could you not have your cards out during the service? And then the next week I would be shaking, my hands would be shaking because I never had cards out of my hand for more than five minutes at a time. And so then I would take the little donation envelopes and I'd put those in my hands and I would palm them back and forth, and I'd, you know, because they were about the size, about the, like the size of a card, but about an inch longer. And then what I did after that is I got blank cards, USPC, US Playing Card Company, I just got a, a deck of blank cards, and that's what I use, and I keep them in my wife's Bible. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I, I do understand what you mean, that you don't consider it as work. I don't do that much card tricks, I do a little bit of three card Monte and that kind of stuff, but uh, I'm very in, much into books and that kind of stuff, and many say the same to me, how can you read that much? But to me, it's... I enjoy it, so it's, yeah, exactly. it's not work. So. If it becomes a passion, see, it's yes. my occupation, it's my passion, it's my love, and it's my hobby. And so when, you, get, when you, put a, a, you put that same thing all together, it turns out to be, you know, an average of 14 hours a day yeah. practice. And the thing about cards, unlike a, a pianist or a, someone that plays guitar, you know, Liberace, the piano player, he could not put his car, piano in the movie theater when he went to the movie theater. Mm -hmm. He couldn't put it in the car when he would uh, drive in the car. I can uh, take my cards anywhere and I have a little 6 inch by 12 inch piece of plastic with a felt on it that I have in a rubber band and I have a deck of cards rubber banded around it. So as soon as I get in the car, I 
pull out my lap pad, I pull out my cards, and then I put my seatbelt on, and, uh, and I'm able to practice. When I'm at conventions, at the movie theater, wherever I am, I'm able to practice because cards are only two and a half inches by three and a half inches. Yeah. Ah, that's great. I, I really like that, how you motivate yourself. And I think we can more or less skip the next question because you already answered that. How do you motivate yourself to do this? But as you said, it's it's your passion and then you just do it. Yeah, it's like a, like a cigarette smoker. They will smoke two, two to three packs of cards a day, uh, decks of uh, cigarettes a day. Yeah. I go through two to three decks of cards a day. The only difference is theirs uh, takes money and mine makes money. Mm. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's so true. And this leads me up to my next question. You're so good at handling a deck of cards and doing karate and all that stuff. I, I believe that Di Vernon said about you that you can do what no other man can do with a deck of cards. Something like that. Is that right? Uh, well, if you want to hear, uh, I, I've heard the quotes so many times. He, he wrote... Um, After seeing countless numbers of card experts execute for over 80 years, I consider Luka Turner to be by far the most skillful. He demonstrates the great, the most difficult new moves with the greatest of ease. I doubt if anyone can equal him. And that was uh, that he wrote that. And then on a TV interview on CBS, he said, "This man here, Richard Turner, does things with cards that no one else in the world can do. No one. I don't care if you go to China, France, or Germany. He does things that no one else." can do it he does them beautifully but i say that's very rare very rare to have experts like that so uh. that was a pretty darn good words from my the person i had the privilege of working with for 17 years yeah and the words from the professor uh layman's don't know how grand this is to get the, those kind of words from divern but it's uh, that's yeah it's uh, i have no words for it really <laughs> And, and, and uh, he was, you know, he was my friend. He became, I was, he was closer to me than he was to his own son. Oh. He became uh, my wife and I through his eighty, his ninety eighth birthday, two months before he died. Mm. He was my best man when I got married. Oh, and um, and uh, we were uh, we were more like a father son or grandfather son than we were student teacher. I love that. And uh, to to finish off the question, because the punchline line of all this is that you're blind. How is this I, possible? I, <laughs> I can't. Well, my vision started going south. Is I started losing it when I was nine, and it was a progression. Uh, by the time I was uh, 11, I was considered uh, legally blind, and I had to go to a special school. During my teens and 20s, my vision was measured at what's called 20 over 400. 20 to over 200 is legally blind. 20 over 400 is twice as low as what's considered legally blind. Mm -hmm. Then, after, then it all disappeared. But uh, to me, I have a very rare disease, a very rare uh, condition called Charles Bonnet syndrome. It was first documented in 1760, and Dr. Oliver Sacks, he writes about it in, in his book called The Mind's Eye in 2010. His mm -hmm. book. He talks about other cases. Um, what, what is good about what I do is, if you have you ever looked into a kaleidoscope, you know what a kaleidoscope is. You turn it and it's all kinds of colors. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I, that's what I see. I see a kaleidoscope of colors, patterns, images, shapes, and they're. I don't see them in the back of the mind. I can look at them. I see them all around me, just as clearly as you see everything that's in front of you. But the thing is, what I can do is I can manipulate these colors and patterns and shapes into images. In other words, say I want to build a house, which I've done, I'm, or I want to design a deck. I can watch in full scale, in three dimension, like somebody looking at what they call virtual reality. I will watch the whole thing being engineered in front of, you, in front of me. I'll watch the piers come down, okay? And then I'll, you'll watch my head turn all the way around because I have, okay, 16-foot beads. I'll have to go over there. They're, they're going to have to be anchored over there. And, and so I can watch and create things uh, in front of me. Or, or, or when I designed, I designed and created a couple of, of 
puzzle and board games, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and I will design them. In, I will sit there and watch the game being played. Or when I'm, like I said, with my game Daddy, which is a logic game, it's kind of a takeoff of the classic, the Tower of Hanoi, except for the formula is buried because it's done with cards. And I have a good friend named Steve Forte, who's one of the top, well, I think one of the best card men ever. And uh, his kids like me to play it. And what I'll do is they'll be in the back seat of the car and they'll have the batty cards laid out and I'll sit in the front and I will play it in my mind while they're moving the cards. And the thing about the game is if you play it on a very low level, it's six to seven moves to resolve. Every time you add one card, it doubles the complexity by double plus one. And I've uh, I've done as high as a level 15, which is over 16,000 to 32,000 moves in a particular sequence, depending on the shuffle. And that's if you don't make any mistakes. And even the level six or seven will take millions of combinations, and eight, nine, ten will have billions of combinations to resolve, you know, uh, uh, combinations if you miss and um, and like I said, I I will play it uh, over the phone with people on, and they'll just go, "How can you keep up and do that?" And and, and uh, anyway, it's one it's kind of one of the exhi- exhibitions that I'll I'll do playing the game um, uh, in front of somebody while they're moving the cards, and I tell them, "Okay, take this card, move it there." Anyway, I, I'll I'll talk faster than uh, they can even move the cards. <laughs> I understand the way how it works. I I can't say that I have the same skill, but I, I think in the same manner. I, I like to think in sort of shapes and that kind of stuff. And I also played a lot of chess in my days. And I played against a, a grandmaster who was playing with his back to like, I think we were 15 people or something like that. And he right. defeated 12 of us and draw three. So I've seen this kind of stuff, so it's just amazing. So I would love yeah, to see... A, that's, a, that's a good example of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Seeing with the mind's eye. So, um, and then I can, uh, you know, I can instantly look at, create in front of me anything I want. If I want to see the image of, of a person, you know, uh, I can see it. If I want to see an image of, a, of uh, my wife in a bathing suit, I can see it. Oh. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good trick. <laughs> yeah. And as I have understood it, you never tell the audience that you are blind when you perform. And how come? Because m- most artists would build their act during something like this. Like Kudabox, who made his whole act about him being the man with the x-ray eyes. He was blind as well. And he made this yeah. uh, uh, act where he could see what people were writing and all that kind of stuff. How come you don't tell the audience? Well, I knew Kuda Bucks very well. He was a friend of mine. Um, but he could see his act. He would blindfold himself. And, of course, you know, he, uh, yeah. he had uh, tricks to where he actually still could see what he was doing. Yes, I know. Um, and so... Uh, but didn't he have but, a impaired vision? He was very... I don't know if he well, was... No, in, his, in his later years, yes. All right, okay. he got older, yeah. yes. Um, but he used to he used to get very frustrated with Vernon and I because we would sit and practice and and Kuda would want to go up and play hearts and he'd say Professor we play hearts and then Professor said, I'll be right up I'll be right up and then uh, then Kuda would go away about two hours later he'd come down Professor we play hearts he said I'll be right up I'll be right up and Kuda would go and then two hours later he'd come down <laughs> six hours later he we he never he Professor and I never stopped and he would always get. Sometimes he'd get irritated with, with me and he'd say, second deal, it looks good, but what, what is it good for? And, of course, it's good for many things, <laughs> but that gets off the topic. Um, uh, what was the, sorry, the, the question, well, oh, why don't, why do I don't tell in the show? Yeah, well, you could use it as a gimmick or something. I don't tell people in my show that I see because it has nothing to do with the act. I figure my work and my skill should stand on its own. Mm. And I'm playing the part of a gambler, and the, uh, and most gamblers can see. So I play the part of a sighted person. So I have trained myself, and I've been trained to look at people like I can see them. Even though now, if you get a physician or a doctor in the off- audience, they will catch on. Uh, but as a rule, um, uh, most people don't catch on. 
Uh, but, but it depends on where I'm. If, I, if I'm at the Magic Castle, where it's a completely <clears throat> me, controlled environment, 80% of the people will not know uh, uh, until someone tells them or if someone has told them. Mm. In the Condit show, we do tell them. They say, we, uh, Todd Robbins will say, uh, Banachek uses tells to determine what, uh, what, what your card is. Now, Richard Turner, he can't use visual tells because he can't see, but he has million dollar fingers. But the thing is, so he tells the audience that I can't see, but the audience, 80% of them don't believe him. They think it's part of the con. And uh, because I make a real effort of looking at the audience, looking at the people next, my assistants at the table. But a funny story, this last show, uh, one of our last shows, Todd Robbins posted he saw that. He said, "I saw the funniest thing, because we're getting ready to do a three-card monty. Where I'm doing three-card monty, and they put ten. We put ten thousand dollars on the table for the girls to play with. We give them ten thousand in real money, and um, and then I quickly I, you know, let them play it for real. And but I take it away from them. And at the end, the girl on my right goes to high five me, and I'm totally totally oblivious to it." And uh, she goes, she has her hand up there. I didn't even know this until a guy named Sandy Marshall, the, the son of Jay Marshall, the magician. Sandy Marshall is also a magician and a screenwriter and a playwright. Yeah. He's actually writing a screenplay on my life story. And so he's been traveling around the world with me. And uh, his wife, he called him at 2 in the morning and said, I heard that the, your assistant, Richard's assistant, went to high five of him and he high five him. And he totally ignored him, had no clue that he was doing it. And uh, so that was, uh, I didn't even, so that's how I found out was how it went on, the, went on Facebook and went around the world. And then it passed to Sandy, or passed to Sandy's wife, to Sandy, to me. And that's how I found out. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I remember another interview with you. And I, if I remember clearly, you said something up. But that you don't see your blindness as a deal, disability, but as a blessing. What do you mean uh, about that? Well, as I was telling you, I can, uh, I can, I can see things that other people can't see. Mm -hmm. I can use my mind to create. If I want to design a house, I've never had, a, I've never had any, I've never had any training in construction. Yet I have designed and built house, houses. I've designed and built decks. I've designed and built uh, different things, and it's because of the, my 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 own vision, my seeing with the mind's eye, that I can do these things. And the other thing is, uh, it has given me a sense of touch that Larry Jennings, a good magician friend of all of ours, yep. used to say, Richard Turner has the finest touch in magic anywhere in the world. And uh, and and it was be and because of that touch, you know, when I'm stacking or or stripping or, or uh, dealing seconds, you know, because my, my thumb, I can apply the ex precise amount of pressure to push over 22.6 thousandths of an inch. And uh, with this deck, that's the caliper of two cards. And other magicians will see, how can you push over exactly two cards and have them be perfectly lined up? And uh, But you know, so it, it, it has given me a sense of touch. Uh -huh. And since cards is... You know, 90% touch uh, that really uh, has been an enhancement. So other people are, you know, they try to estimate things by looking and it, and it becomes a crutch for them. And, and anyway, so it has given me a better touch for the cards. Have I understood you correctly if I say that you are a man of faith? Yes. Uh, did well, you please. grow up uh, in a religious home or? Uh... Yeah, I went, well, I went to church as a kid. But then, uh, then of course I rebelled, and um, and then I, you know, when I look at things, mm -hmm. and I look at history, and uh, like the Bible, the Bible says that God created us in His image, and I think about, I think about evolution, the idea that there's a big bang, a rock flies across the universe, it turns into a monkey, and then bang, here I am, a living, breathing person with the ability to reason and create. Then I look at the other side. The Bible says God made us in his image. He took dirt and made us in his image. I think, well, that sounds almost as far-fetched. But then I think about, okay, I am made an image of God. What has 
man taken and made out of dirt. You can look at every, right now, wherever you are, look at your, look in front of you. You look at your phone. That was made out of dirt. You know, some kind of metal or something that came out of the ground. You look at a, a, a God took dirt and he made a, a bird. Man took dirt and he made an airplane. God took dirt and he made a brain. Mm-hmm. Man took dirt and we made a computer. God took dirt and he made an eyeball. Man took dirt and made a, a camera. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and, I see. Uh, and I think, so we, in his image, we have taken dirt and made everything that's around us in one form or another. It's dirt or grown from dirt. And, uh, and so that was one thing. Then I think about the Statue of Liberty. Okay, I, say, I think, okay, that Statue of Liberty did not create itself. You know, somebody, there was an engineer behind that, that creation of that wonderful symbol of freedom. And, or I look at another, another way I look at things. I think about uh, evolution. Okay that, mm-hmm. okay, that here, a man and a woman at the same time evolve uh, with just the right parts to come together to make babies, to make other pieces, uh, make more of us. That we, how do we, that we just happen to come together at the same time. And you can talk about every species out there. And I look at that as like, okay, you show me where a Ferrari evolved on its own. At the same time, a gas station evolved on its own with just the, with the gasoline needed to, put the, to pour into the gas tank of the Ferrari to make it run. You know, that, you, you'd think, well, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard of. And a, a, a person... Is far more sophisticated than a Ferrari or a Ford or a car. You know, a car. When I say a Ferrari, I mean a car. Yes. And uh, so I, I, I look at things like that and I go, you know, there has to be a creator. And then I look at things that, things that I can't see visually, but I can see through the mind's eye, like color. I'm fascinated by color. Red, blue, greens, yellows, purples, which I see in vivid colors all around me. And then I think about that, this creator created all of his creation. He took his birds and he painted them blues and yellows and greens. And he took all his fish and he painted them all different colors. He took rocks and painted his rocks all different colors. There's sapphires and emeralds and, and, uh, and amethyst and, you know, all, all, all different colors. And, and, and then, the, then I think about glass. Here's something God created something that we can take and you can't see it at all and it's hard it can be hard as uh as you know you can't punch through it but you can't see it at all in fact you can't see it with a microscope you use pieces of glass to put something in between those pieces of glass to look at it through a microscope and uh to me that's fascinating just glass the fact that there's something there totally solid yet you can't see it no, so anyway, though, and so I go. There's, there's a career, there has to be a creator. We were not here. We were, we were no piece of accident. That there was an engineer behind us. I see it because uh, I'm a Christian, uh, one of the few uh, magicians that actually have a open faith here in Sweden. Ma- most magicians here are quite strict atheists, right. and uh, we always have these kind of talks about uh, evolution. But I, I'm still a firm. I, I don't want to say believer in evolution, but I accept the theory. But for me, uh, the Genesis, the first two chapters, are beautiful um, allegories about evolution, more or less. Because uh, for me, it's an image of how God slowly forms man from the dirt or from the earth. And that's more or less how evolution works if you look at it from a sort of philosophical point of view or that kind of stuff. What's your thoughts about that? Could you accept that or you don't? Uh, no, I, 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 I agree with you. And, uh, uh, and the thing is, like you said, the first few chapters of Genesis, we don't know how much time it was from day one to day two. You know, because with, with God, a, th- a day is a, as, a, as is a, a thousand years and a thousand years is a, as a moment, you mm-hmm. know? So there's, he's not inside of time. We are inside of time. Yes. Our time is ticking away. He's outside of time. He's not constrained by time. So there is no time for him. So what we see, what what uh, what what we see is uh, as a day 
it might be a thousand years to him, or what we see as a thousand years might be a moment for him, for God. And so uh, we don't know. It could have uh, been, we don't know what the distance is from the one step to the next step to the next step from when he made the, uh, the earth and into the seas and then the animals in the seas to, to Adam. You know, that, that could be, uh, we, the, we don't know what that length of time it was. <laughs> and, and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, we could talk about this for hours. I think this is a really interesting and complicated subject, and it's yeah, it is exactly an endless discussion. Right. And I me, that. yeah, uh, me myself, I, I actually live in an old church, and uh, I go regularly to services and all that kind of stuff. And uh, but I'm very interested in those precisely those questions that you brought up. Uh, but when I here in Sweden, it's very popular, at least among. Um, the churches that you see everything that is, if we say, out of the ordinary, like if you, you are blind, that would be considered a little bit strange. There's even something wrong because the right Christian or the, the right believer should be as normal as possible, and that's uh, what I'm aiming for in with my next question because I've written a small book called Wolves in Sheep Clothing that's about false faith healers. It's like right. uh, James Randi's uh, The Faith Healers, a Swedish ver- version of that one, sort of. Right. And uh, have you encountered many Christians that want to pray for you so that your eyesight is restored and that kind of stuff? And how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah. I've had many times I've had people uh, just come up and lay hands and pray for healing. And uh, I tell them, you don't understand. Not, I, I say everybody has a disability. Ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, you know, we have been de- uh, decomposing. We're growing older and then we die. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, even Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead, here he still got old and died. So he died twice. So we all have something. And uh, I look at, uh, I look at, okay, so, uh, visual, you know, blind is one of the more obvious ones. So people look at it as more severe. But for me, I think the worst handicap of all is what I call procrastination or laziness. Oh my gosh, give me blindness over that any day. You know, somebody that's lazy, you know, they, they go nowhere. Mm-hmm. Somebody that procrastinates, they never get anything done. To me, that's a worse handicap. And so we, we all have something that we're having to deal with because we're not perfect. We have, we have bodies that will age and they will, they will eventually uh, fall apart and turn into dust, go back to dust. But I still believe that there's a spirit there that can live on. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, when I have people uh, lay hands on me, I'll tell them, that's not what God has for me. God has given me other gifts and if I had to, ch- if I had to change my gift for a full sight again, I would be afraid that I would lose the gifts that I do have, and the gifts that I do have have served me much better than if I would have been just your normal Joe Blow growing up with a full vision. So I tell people we all have uh, gifts and we all have things that we have to deal with. Uh, I really like that last comment because, uh, as I see it, there are more or less no disabilities at all, just different kind of people. And everyone can learn something from other people that are different from them. Yes. That's more or less how I see it, because I have friends that are what we would call maybe multi-handicapped. And I have learned so much from them, how to be grateful for what they do have, and all these kind of stuff. So maybe there is a purpose to everything. I don't know, but that's how I choose to see it, at least. Well, yeah, and I, and I see that with you. I'm very thankful. I, I, I don't look at what I have as a disability. In fact, I have to... I, my problem is the other way around. I have to make sure I don't become too arrogant. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, I can do things that other people can't do. Uh, when I, even in the, martial, in the fighting ring, when it comes to strength... I, uh, when I, when I took my fourth degree black belt test, part of the requirement was to measure, to measure your muscular skeletal strength. That's measuring how strong your muscles are. Yep. I lifted a total of 222,000 
888 pounds using 3,190 reps. Now, the person that trained alongside me was 23 years old. He was a black belt, and he weighed 225 pounds. He weighed 50 pounds more than we eat I, than I did. And he couldn't do 50% of the weight or the reps on any exercise we did on, all the way through that. He did not do half of what I did. And he was half my age. And uh, I was an old man at the time. I was in my late 40s. So, uh, but how, how do I do that? I can take and I will see in front of me. Like when I'm doing an exercise, I never have what's called lactic acid buildup. I don't know if you know what that means. That's where your muscles start burning from the exercise. And uh, you, know, you get that lactic acid buildup, and then all of a sudden yeah, they wear down on you. Yep. I'm able to do a tremendous amount of rest because I will see in front of me. At the end of my, when I get to the point of exertion, a big mass of muscle like Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or a gorilla, I see this image, and I mentally connect my arms to that mass of muscle, and I watch that mus that image in front of me pulling my weights up and because I put my mind is focused on that image my muscles no longer feel the stress as I continue to press hence I can go a whole lot further than the person that I'm with and that's why I do when I do sets of reps you know I never do 10 reps I do uh, decks of reps deck meaning 52 mm -hmm. then when I turned 52 years old I thought well shoot now I have to go further I have to go to deck with Joker so now when my son, he does 52 reps, I do 54 uh, because I have to, you know, now that I'm old man, I have to do even more. I have to do a deck with jokers. And so we do uh, tremendous amounts of repetitions. And uh, once again, I have a different mental image that I will see for every exercise that I do. And because I will project uh, my mind in that image, my mind is, is distracted from what my body is doing. Hence, my body is not feeling the stress again, as I continue to exercise. I know that sounds very confusing and probably with the language difference, it'll be hard for you to, to, to really understand what I'm explaining, but it... Uh, I understand um, quite well what you mean. I, I don't claim that I have some, the same degree, but I, I'm, my brain works a little different than the normal brain, so I, I, can, I can understand and the, the power of the mind, how to sort of convince yourself to do more than you are maybe capable of uh, just by doing it. So this exactly. is good. Yeah, and I, and I trained my, my wife. My wife has a black belt in three different karate systems and two second degree black belts, and one of them is under me. And I trained her how to use her mind's eye in her training. And within a month, she increased her muscular endurance by 30%, 30 days, 30%, just by using these images, exercises that I developed many years ago and the thing is I never told anyone about these uh, images until John Rockerbomber his last name is R-A-C-H-E-R-B-A-U-M-E-R -E -E he's a writer a magic writer he's written over 60 books and many many articles for Genie and Magic Magazine he's been writing a biography on my life story for the past five years oh. and he's just about finished with it and um, uh, up until he started writing this book I never told anyone about my mental exercises that I used when I worked out because I didn't want others to know how it was I always whipped their butt. <laughs> oh, I, I really like that. Oh, I could talk about this mind thing uh, or, uh, for hours, but uh, we have to close the interview quite soon. <laughs> and uh, before closing, uh, do you have any tips for our John Card Mechanics and uh, the Magicians of Sweden? Because we have many talented John Kids and uh, what I lack here in Sweden is the sort of way of think that I see in you. And what is your tip to them, the young ones? What I would tell them is first decide what they want to do. Then if they say, let's say they want to uh, learn a second deal. You take that move and you break it down piece by piece. Whatever it is you want to learn, you take it. And you break it down piece by piece, and then you practice it in super slow motion until every exacting element of the muscle memory is firmly embedded in the brain. Then once you get that movement and that move down the way it should look, not the way you can do or get away with it, but the way it would look the most natural and be the most deceptive, 
and the way you would ideally want it done, when you get that down, you sit there and practice it slow motion, really slow, making your hands do exactly what you want, and you keep doing that. And then eventually, anything you consciously practice over and over will eventually turn into a subconscious habit. Mm. And that's what you want. Don't stop practicing. That is when the real practice hours begin. And the good thing is you don't have to schedule practice time. You can be driving in a car. You can be talk, we can be talking on the phone as I'm doing right now, as I'm doing one-hand shifts at this, at this particular point. Um, you can be sitting in the movie theater. Uh, at the grocery store, they have a little place where people set their checkbooks. Most people don't realize they actually made those things for people to practice their cards while their wife checks out the, the groceries. <laughs> and so uh, you uh, and you uh, set up your house where you have a way to be able to practice wherever you are, where the, where it's no effort. And uh, of course, coins and cards are the easiest because they can go anywhere and everywhere. But they again take the move, figure out how it looks when a normal person does it. Logicians have a habit of making these awkward moves that become unnatural, and even if the audience doesn't see the move, they think to themselves, I don't know what you did, but I know you did something. And that was something Vernon would really stress, naturalness. Mm. So be natural in what you do, analyze how to do it and how to do it where it's the most deceptive and the most natural, practice it in super slow motion, and then just keep practicing it until it becomes a subconscious habit. And then you'll be walking down the street, sitting in a theater, and you move, you're sitting there, deal in a second, put it in the middle of the deck. Deal a second, put it in the middle of the deck. Or you're shifting the cards, just sitting there shifting the cards, hour after hour, doing the same thing. I would average about 18,000 second deals in a row. So I deal a second every second for like five hours at a time. And so uh, that's why I'm so, I've done so darn, darn many second deals. I'm, <laughs> I, that's my, my biggest habit of all. Uh, all but right. anyway, that's what I do. Yeah, great. So thank you, Richard Turner. Hope to see you in Sweden soon, or at least hope to see you your show conned, or maybe at the Magic Castle. Thank you very much for doing this interview, and uh, thank you once again. I, I, I'm a little bit speechless because this is such a great honor for me. Well, Samuel, it was very nice of you to ask me, and it was a pleasure visiting with you, and it's a pleasure to have a, a Christian brother over there in Sweden, and. Um, Uh, and then once again, there will, there will be some ways you can see because there there's a documentary that they're working on on my life story. Oh. We should be filming the we should be uh, getting the contract signed in the next two or three weeks. And then Sandy Marshall, the son of Jay Marshall, the magician, he is a writer and screenplay and director, and he's written anyway. He, he's had seven Emmy award nominations and won a couple. Anyway, he's been writing the movie script of my life story. So there is a way that I'll be over there in Sweden one way or the other, if it's on screen or if it's in person. Yeah, you must tell me if you come here to Gothenburg. Uh, it's, it would be such an honor to have you perform here at our uh, Magic Club or something, or just take a... Yeah, uh, well, you could drink water, but <laughs> whether could, uh, <laughs> could have a beer. There, there you go. If you like this video, press thumbs up, comment, and share. If you want to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, you'll find the links in the description box below. Until next time, have a wonderful day.